And we're back. How are we doing? All right, so listen, the last section we talked about the origins of policing in America. We defined what the slave patrols were. We talked about how do we get from slave patrol to modern day police force. But we, we need to take it a step further. So in this section, we'll talk about defining police violence. We'll talk about Jim Crow, police violence defined, and aspects of police brutality. In other words, how do we get to the point from serve and protect to outright violence against communities as a whole? So this quote, ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy of justice um, uh, that justice can have. And this quote was by James Baldwin. And when we think about ignorance, um, when we think about the power of those individuals that use power against certain people in our communities, in our society, we have examples of this. A reminder to everyone who sees that I am a man, not just a figure, not just someone who, who to be identified as some kind of perpetrator, but I am a man. And for many people that are the victim of police violence, these are some of the things that they would like to tell not only police forces, but um, the majority population as a whole. Jim Crow years. These years were from 1877 to approximately uh, 1950, the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. And they, um, they were marked with signs like this, no colored allowed, where people were um, put on in different categories based on the color of their skin, not the content of their character, um, to paraphrase the great late Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, examples of Jim Crow laws. In Oklahoma, telephone booths were segregated. Min Mississippi had separate soft drink machines for blacks and whites. In Georgia, African Americans could not swear to tell the truth on the same Bible used by white witnesses. Now, innately, I find something wrong with that. Um, in North Carolina, factories were separated in black and white sections, and in Alabama, in an Alabama town, you couldn't even you couldn't even play cards with someone who was white. And this is so far away from the reality of what we see today. But some of the remnants of this segregation that still exists in terms of how police forces are used against certain communities. What is police brutality? Police brutality is a form of unwarranted physical violence perpetrated by an individual or group symbolically representing a government sanctioned law enforcement agency as opposed to an individual perpetrator who only represents themselves. So it speaks to a collective body that utilizes their power um, in a way that is not necessarily in line with what they say that they're about. Police brutality occurs within the context of officers possessing the privilege Again, a privilege of assumed justification for their actions um, when they were there really to protect and serve. Things to consider. And I want to go back to what I said in the previous um, lesson that this is not an indictment against the police force. But this is just um, an acknowledgement that some things are not necessarily fair when it comes to certain people. Um, police are armed and trained to defuse crisis. And if that's the case, why in so many instances, rather than defuse the crisis, these crises are escalated? Many of the police officers accused and are in rare cases not convicted, rare cases they're, not, um, they're never convicted, unwarranted violence report being afraid of ethnic minorities. So this is like, this is a disconnect within these, th these communities. Officers are stating that they have some kind of fear of these particular communities. Research also states this Blue code of silence. Officers, even though they realize or, or we see or officers see that other officers are um, perpetrating acts of violence against communities, there is this, this ideology that they're not necessarily going to do anything. In some cases, they believe to steal or to you know, tamper with evidence is, is much more egregious than actually performing violence against someone. Um, and... It is easier to side with the perpetrator because the only thing per per perpetrators require is silence. So many people who are, who are, you know, who witness the violence, it's easier to, for them to side with the perpetrator because the one that receives the violence, in many cases, are silent. And conversely, um, victims, you know, are negatively impacted by, by these particular instances. Um, they are afraid to speak, they are afraid to talk, and in many, many instances they are 
are dealing with tremendous trauma, which we will talk about as we move on. Police brutality has a number of indicators. And one of the biggest indicators is excessive force. Displays of power that is stronger or more violent than necessary to keep a situation safe or under control. And this particular area has the, a force continuum that covers one, police presence, meaning the presence of police in the community. And when we talk about excessive force, uh, many, one of the communities I work in particular is Brownsville. And when, it, when we talk about police presence, Police presence is, is, is noted in these communities, not necessarily because uh, police are there and the community is accepting of the, of the police, but in some cases it looks like quarantine. It looks like police are there as guards in some kind of prison camp. Verbalization. Um, examples of verbalization is, hey you, keep it moving. Where are you going? Empty hand control. This is where an officer basically takes, um, you know, tells you to do something without necessarily having um, something in their hand. But it conversely, less than lethal, me lethal methods are when an officer utilizes some kind of force that does not necessarily lead to the death of someone. And last but not least, lethal methods um, is what we've seen in the news on a number of occasions. But we'll go into less exam examples of less than lethal force. And one of the things I want to bring to your attention is a case where on July 18, 2016, Mr. Charles Kinsey, a trained special needs caregiver, was helping a client with autism who wandered from the group home when he was shot. And I put the link up for everyone to really watch this particular video because on this video you see an individual um, who, once police came to the scene, he expressed who he was. He stated that he was not a threat. He was actually laying on the floor when the officer decided to discharge the gun and shoot this man. Now, fortunately, he was not killed, but this is an example of how force, how excessive force can be used in a negative way, not necessarily in a positive way. Proves police brutality against um, black men, African-American men. Um, according to research, police officers view black males as potential perpetrators, and that would lead to acts of violence, meaning that they innately see black men as violent, perpetrators, criminals. Um, for myself as a black man, I have certainly witnessed this. I've certainly been pulled over. I was certainly assumed to be guilty rather than, you know, innocent. You know, I remember a time where I worked for an a, um, for an organization. I worked for the Bronx Defenders, and I was coming back from a, from a case, and I was happy about the case. Me and my colleagues, we were, we, we were, you know, elated that this particular judgment was made, and all of a sudden, an officer came up to me, and he, um, and to my left was two of my coworkers, two white women, and an Asian woman uh, at that. And the officers basically pulled me to the side and, and wanted to search me for no cause. And had it not been for my coworkers who were lawyers, and they basically said, what are you doing to him? Leave him alone. I don't know how that incident would have ended, and I have dozens of other incidents, and I'm sure African Americans who are watching this video, as well as those of your colleagues and those of your fellow citizens, they have tremendous stories about similar things. Therefore, it did not, it's not beyond the realm of possibility for officers to aggressively move or act towards a person of color. When they think about a person of color, especially a black male, they view him as a predator. Yes, the predator. Automatically. And this is something that was innate. And when you look, the origins of slave um, of police officers, um, of police departments being that, was, that would be slave patrols, Many of us um, don't find this correlation being too difficult. Police violence against women. Um, there's also evidence of police violence against women. In the intro, we talked about Sandra Bland and how she was the, um, the, the direct recipient of violence as it relates to police force. In a recent study, researchers administered a, sur administered a survey, um, the Police Practice Inventory Survey, and they surveyed approximately four states and some of the findings, they, they, they surveyed about over 3,500, um, utilized 900 within the sample. And we have some examples, you know, 40 um, non-Hispanic whites, they, um, 400 of them reported to be, to, to have as a part of this particular study. Um, lifetime prevalence of police violence among women in the sample included 4% saying that they, they had been vi victims of physical abuse. 3% um, said sexual abuse, psychological abuse, as well as um, police violence and neglect 
also was um, pretty high in this particular sample. But one of the biggest key indicators of this sample was not just the violence that police officers have meted out against these individuals, but rather individuals who, are, who go to help or who seek help from the police um, force as a result of intimate partner violence, sexual assault in these other areas, and are made to believe or made to feel that their, their life is threatened or their situation is not that serious. And these are some things that women have said over and over again and in light of what we have today with these various movements, the Me Too movement, the Time's Up movement, many women feel that police officers are not necessarily there as a support, but rather as a hindrance in many respects. Moving on, economic and financial strain. Police brutality affects the community in a number of ways. Community health through its toll on pr productivity, economy, in relation to job loss after incarceration. Survivors of br brutality may feel um, disabilities as a result of excessive force. And police brutality also affects the economic pr productivity of black communities because loved ones take time away um, to grieve a death of someone and a number of other key indicators. So when we think about police violence, it has a number of effects. Police brutality has tremendous effect on these communities. So let's not discount what this does to communities of color um, as we move on to the, to the next particular lesson. So these are the reference, references we have this, with this area and we'll move on.